eh, proyectos europeos y uh, está especializado en, en la investigación y, desa y desarrollo de pedagogías digitales y, y de aprendizaje potenciado por las nuevas tecnologías. Eh, también es exper experto en formación digital y profesorado y últimamente eh, está muy implicado y desarrollando sistemas relacionados con la inteligencia artificial, sobre todo aplicada a la educación. Eh, Graham Atwell eh, es director también de una organización de investigación independiente que está localizada, que tiene una doble sede en Valencia y Reino Unido, que se llama Pontidiswo. Eh, él es además profesor asociado a la Universidad de Garwick y um, sus investigaciones o su línea de investigación incluye el uso de la tecnología para la enseñanza y el aprendizaje y el intercambio de conocimiento y también para la formación del profesorado y formadores en el enfoque pedagógico del uso de la tecnología para el aprendizaje. Lidera también, al igual que George, varios proyectos internacionales en este campo y también tiene una, se especializa en la línea de, de la inteligencia artificial, artificial aplicada en centros educativos. Y también tiene otra línea de investigación que, uh, que trabaja la evaluación digital en la educación y en la formación profesional. Eh, nuestro tercer invitado es David Hill, que es un facilitador y profesor universitario en tecnologías de la información y la comunicación. Tiene, su enfoque se orienta a cambiar comportamientos y mentalidades en torno al uso de las nuevas tecnologías, tiene una visión más innovadora en ese sentido. Y, y uh, la pandemia, como ha sucedido en muchos casos, pues también ha cambiado un poco su perspectiva y durante pues, bueno, la, la, la pandemia que ya acabo de mencionar, pues su función eh, se ha orientado pasando de apoyar a, a los estudiantes, pues, apoyar al profesorado y a los profesionales. Sobre todo también uh, trabajando elementos como la realidad virtual. Uh, Martin eh, Severnels eh, eh, es miembro de Go Spectrum School, que está situada en Amberes, en Bélgica. Eh, era fisioterapeuta, aunque hace 17 años empezó a cambiar un poco su perspectiva profesional y se empezó a dedicar a lo que es eh, las nuevas tecnologías uh, de la información y la comunicación orientadas al profesorado y al alumnado. Eh, además, trabaja en una editorial que publica material educativo relacionado con, con las TIC y la inteligencia artificial. Eh, so, I just did your presentation. So, um, I don't know, um, we had a bunch of questions and, and topics that we were ready to discuss. So, Uh, George, do you want to do you want to start and open the the discussion? Okay. Uh, yes, may, may let me let me change. Uh, it's very strange because I, I'm looking on the screen of the of the of this uh, platform, but I have to change my PowerPoint in reality. Oh, okay. yeah. We can see your screen though. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay. Now, now I just uh, before to start, I, I just. Uh, need to mention also for dissemination <laughs> reasons that uh, uh, the, in this conference uh, the experience we are going to share with you is coming from the implementation of three uh, projects. One is called Tackle AI, uh, which is main aim is to improve digital skills and competencies of uh, vocational education and training, uh, train teachers and trainers in the age of artificial intelligence. Second project is called AI at School, uh, where uh, Pascandri University is partner, and uh, the main aim is to help uh, uh, secondary education as teachers to, to teach uh, about AI first, and second, to use AI to improve their teaching practices. And finally, we have another project uh, which uh, titled uh, VET, uh, IDC VET, uh, which uh, It comes from improved digital competencies for vet teachers and trainers. And uh, the main aim is to, to, to help uh, to support uh, vet teachers and trainers to improve digital competencies based on the Digicomp uh, EDU framework of the European Union. Uh, we prepared some, uh, some topics for discussion. Uh, I'll give the ground to Graham uh, to present those topics and then we'll have some questions around those topics later. Graf. I mean as well if there's any way people uh, there have got your own questions 
Um, we're a little used to the fact that people are quite shy and we got quite excited ourselves in uh, devising questions, but we're very happy as well if there's any live questions coming from people in this session. So these topics we thought were the main topics related to uh, crisis, uh, technology and education, which is obviously on the lips of everyone is the issue of COVID and the reaction to COVID and what's happened with digital in COVID. We think there's still big questions around equality and access to education. And we think that's an uh, issue, especially related crisis and gender equality in technology based jobs. Uh, the climate crisis is a crisis which is only growing at the moment. And I'm not sure that technology and education has really addressed it yet, but it's certainly another topic. And of course, related is ethics, trust and technology, look into the future, digital skills, AI and education and technology and education and employment. And around all those uh, topics there, we've got about three or four questions, uh, which perhaps we can go to our first group about COVID, and perhaps pass on to the other people on the panel who haven't uh, spoken so far. Now, David, do you want to come in here? Um, yes, I'm more than happy to start. Um, uh, buenas tardes. Uh, hola desde Gales. Um, I'm afraid that's the, the limit of my Spanish, but hopefully it will make sense to some of you. Um, in terms of the, the first part, did digital technologies help staff or students? Um, yes, uh, I think it was vital. Um, we did manage to carry on teaching. Uh, the key issues I suppose we had were twofold. Um, engagement, so making sure people were continuing to engage with their studies and also the variety of learning technologies, uh, whether that's phones or tablets or Chromebooks, uh, the type of web browser, their access to um, communication technologies. So we had a small team, um, I think there were nine of us, who were basically online all of the time, providing one-to-one -one support for both students and staff um, because uh, a lot of students were able to migrate online quite quickly uh, but a lot of staff struggled with the initial move to teaching online uh, in a very short space of time so having a dedicated team that could support them with practical skills do one-to-one -one face-to-face uh, -face support to, to help them get their sessions going um, and support them when they had problems, um, I think was key. Martina, would you like to come in on any of this, uh, these questions? Yeah, well, um, all I can say is we have um, lots of um, disadvantaged students at school. Uh, we live in uh, Antwerp. Lots of students um, don't have a lot of uh, money at home. Eh? So it was hard for them to, to um, stay connected because they didn't have any um, sources to get online. No computer, no internet. And we had to provide them with, with all those uh, stuff. And the little ones, they, they even um, lacked the, the, the skills. So it wasn't that uh, easy to stay connected with all the students. So. Um, yes, I, Sorry, um, I, I think this crisis has certainly highlighted um, the digital gap between yes. Um, both access to basic technologies in a lot of cases and, and equipment, 
um, I, I deal in, I work in a further education college, so I'm dealing with 15 year old plus. Uh, so they all have phones, but phones a lot of the time are not suitable for their studies. Um, you know, trying to, to work through uh, Google Slides on a phone is not practical. So we ended up giving out over a thousand Chromebooks, um, but all of that took um, both time and a sort of coordination between ourselves, especially when social distancing and, and yeah. colleges were closed. So that was quite a challenge. Uh, but certainly I think the, the digital gap between those who've got equipment and those who don't has become far wider uh, during the pandemic. Last day we were talking about this topic actually, uh, George, Graham, Graham and myself, and we were wondering uh, why things are not the same in its country. So I was also wondering if this is a national matter, this is a regional matter, this is a European matter, because it is true that this gap uh, is getting uh, bigger and bigger in cert certain locations in Europe. So uh, last day, Graham was telling me that in England, that I actually, I suppose England was a country that uh, every single student will have his or her computer and access to the internet and so on. He told me that this wasn't happening at all. So I don't know. No, I mean, certainly in Wales, where I am, um, the differences are very pronounced. Um, there's a mixture of coastal towns which have uh, good internet access and then a lot of rural communities who have no internet access or very poor or sporadic uh, mobile phone coverage and access. there's a huge disparity in in people who've got equipment uh, it's actually a very poor ward that I work in so a lot of people don't have laptops or computers or access to them or they would be sharing them with um, yes. three other siblings uh, they might be trying to teach the children at home who are also using the same computer so it's a very varied picture and Gorka uh, I mean even in Spain these differences I mean you were telling us about Basque yeah and saying that yeah people have been given computers everyone's got access etc but i'm based in valencia and it certainly isn't the same here so it's not just differences between countries it's differences between regions in countries and it's differences between regions on different types of schools so uh this gap is socioeconomic uh, and it's uh, geographical as well. So, um, and it's also before in the previous conversation we were talking about um, there is this gap uh, between uh, urban places and rural places where you don't have access to, uh, you know, the proper internet connection or whatever. So, uh, that in, yeah. I'll give another dimension of this. Uh, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's totally socioeconomic uh, issue. You know, even if there are uh, students with equipment and access to the to the, to the internet and the, all the hardware they need, the parents they don't have the digital skills to support them. First, second, uh, we have this uh, this divide among private and uh, public education. I know in Greece, for example, private uh, uh, schools we are more uh, advanced on using platforms. Uh, well equipped, and uh, of course the, the students, uh, the, the average income of the students was much higher, so they have access and they are, were progressing. When at the same time uh, public schools, they had to wait for all of these things to happen slowly from, from, from the ministries. Also, it has to do with, uh, with the, the, the readiness of the, of the teachers. You know, I, I tried to, to understand what is happening, at least in Greece, from this perspective, you know, and I realized that most of the teachers, what they try to do, they try to replicate a face-to-face -face classroom online, and that was not very successful. And that uh, in Greece, at least, was also a political decision from the Ministry of Education that they obliged to have a synchronous learning for six hours a day for the, 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 the children. 
And then one day I saw my 11 year old daughter that they have uh, the zoom open and uh, minimize the zoom. The camera was uh, showing them to look at the screen and they have uh, other applications uh, playing, etc. Because it is, it, 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 it's not efficient to have those children in front of a screen, a screen six hours uh, a day. So that also a big issue for me. How nobody was ready for that, especially the, the teachers. Yeah, I think uh, my view on that, and perhaps we should just discuss this point of the right balance between teaching and learning, because I, uh, is there a right balance? Can we find it? Uh, my view is that what's happened in the crisis, the COVID crisis, is we've had a massive uh, move to online teaching, but I'm not sure we've had much of a move to online learning. <laughs> uh, and it, it's the online learning we need, uh, and we've not really got there so far. What we're doing is replicating classroom teaching with a camera. Exactly. And you are right, this is actually what we were talking about uh, in the previous uh, discussion before we came to this room. And it's actually that we cannot actually replicate the lessons we do when we do, it, when we do them face to face as if we were doing online because things don't happen in the same way. And, and actually, uh, you both are pretty right in this, in this case, I think. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, as, uh, as I discussed when you introduced me, I'm working a lot of with digital pedagogies. Digital pedagogies, it's not the tra traditional face-to-face -face pedagogies online. We need a, a different approach. We need to make uh, the most efficient use of technological tools that allow us to, to, to make, uh, to, to improve learnability, to, 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 to make people learn online. Okay, and uh, this is this has to be our next uh, uh, focus in the future because you know now there is a, a danger to to develop a very negative mindset towards technology education because we know that a lot of uh, teachings were not successful during uh, last year, and I'm, I'm not trying to complain any anyone, but we need to, to be able to evaluate all of this what didn't go well and try to, 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 to create something that it makes sense to work with. I wonder if... Um, go on. I was just wondering how do people see teaching um, let's say next academic year? Um, do, you, do you envisage uh, people returning to the classroom or staying online or uh, a split between the two? We are pushing, uh, or actually they are pushing us to do the lessons uh, face to face. What I'm afraid of is if this is not becoming, um, I don't know, something fashionable for the future, uh, because it is in some cases when we do, for instance, when we talk about higher education, it is a cheaper way to do your 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 tasks. So uh, you get more for the same price. I don't know how to explain this. So I'm afraid that this came to stay here with us. So I think technology is very, very useful when we do our teaching. Online teaching can help us doing uh, things such as flip classroom and stuff like that. But I, I don't think um, changing uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, teaching with online teaching uh, it's going to work totally for the future. I don't know what is your opinion. Um, I, I mean, certainly our plan, um, it, it depends a little bit upon level. Um, so lower level learners, um, whether entry level learners or, or just starting in college, then we envisage them being in for 90% of the time. And then 10% will be uh, online. But as you go up, so uh, by the time we're getting towards um, access to higher education students, then they're looking at around about 50% uh, face to face and 50% online. But it's complicated by the fact that we are a vocational college. You know, we teach um, welding, uh, childcare, motor vehicle, 
construction, carpentry. So those need face-to-face -face elements or, or practical workshop elements. Should we, should we move to the next slides to other topics that uh, we have also interesting? Okay, I, I, I think we already covered this, uh, equality to an access and education and digital gap, the previous comments. I think this is also this is a very very important issue that has about with gender equality in technology based jobs. We know that uh, the ICT market is being dominated by men, and uh, I it's good time to to ask Martina what uh, what she thinks about that as the women in the par in the panel. Well, I can tell you that uh, one of my uh, my own daughters uh, <laughs> has, uh, is uh, following a bachelor electromechanics right now. So, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there are still two um, a few women who are uh, um, uh, going for um, technology technology based jobs. And I don't, I don't understand why, because they, they can do it. They, they can um, think in a logic way. They, they can program. They can do it. But maybe it's the education, the, the parents still, still the doll for the girls and and the, and the car for the boy. I don't know. Maybe we have to to do something about that. To stimulate the, the, the girls, the daughters to uh, be more, yeah, in, interested in technology. I, I, I don't know why it is. No idea. I wonder as well if part of it is the probably correct image of the software industry, which in general, the software industry and things like the games industry have a reputation for extremely long hours and quite a macho culture within them and if that's not the true image then the industry needs to work at changing it but I suspect it is a true image and I suspect the industry needs to change its own culture uh, I mean it's not just a point of equality at this point it's actually a massive question if you've got 50% of the population largely excluded from the development of software and of applications like AI, we know the problems with bias within AI, yeah? Uh, we need women working in technology industry and in the educational technology industry to design and develop applications. Yeah, this is totally agree, correct, Graham, because, you know, the, we, we know that uh, the educational sector, especially the secondary education, has uh, employs a lot of women, yeah? And at the same time, the technologists uh, in education are more men, the ones who design platforms, who design uh, software, etc. Somehow, uh, you, uh, we, need, we need to make a, a better mix of, of that uh, jobs in order to design better tools, better software. David, you've got anything to say on that one? No, I, I think that's an interesting point that George made. Um, certainly in my environment, um, but a lot of the, I should say, there's a greater proportion of uh, female teachers and female library staff. So I work within the, the library and IT department. We have more females than males. Um, but there is certainly that imbalance between and taking on an educational uh, and information role, um, but not crossing into the development role, um, which is, I, I, I don't have the answer. Um, I think it does need a lot more exploration, a lot more work to try and address that balance. Do you think it might be a lack of um, trust, a lack of belief of the, of the the male population in the in the in the skills that that women have, I, I don't know. 
as a software engineer, I, I wouldn't say that, uh, Martin. I would say that there is, a, as you mentioned before, there is a lot of prejudice, you know, and uh, there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, stereotypes. Women, for example, are good to be teachers and men to be uh, mechanics. And uh, this comes uh, far uh, in the past. Uh, but uh, we need to change that. We need to promote those jobs. And I think it's, it's the role of the schools and the universities has to do with the, with the guidance, with the right guidance, and promote those courses to, to and promote the advantages of uh, uh, women being involved in the process of developing software and technology in general. Yes, we I do, think that changed. Also, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, Martin, sorry, 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 my fault. I, I think they need we, role we, models we, as well. Um, yes. They, they, a lot of the problem with the students that I work with, a lot of the issue is opening their eyes to opportunity. They, mm -hmm. They've only known very limited choices, uh, and that may be based upon their environment or their families. Um, and when you tell them and show them different options, uh, hopefully you can inspire them to take on new challenges or seek out new careers rather than just all becoming nurses. Uh, there are a lot more options. Um, and I think having a role model or having uh, people from industry come in and show them what they can do, uh, is, is it a really useful method of addressing the imbalance? Yes, that's very true. Yes, we try to we try to um, stimulate it. We um, but the it's it's also a culture based thing. I think we have lots of immigrants uh, here on our school, and they're not used that, that women are um, choosing for auto car mechanics or something like that, <laughs> because they have they have to go to school and then be a mom and stay at home with the children still. So I don't know, maybe it's it's also culture-based thing. I think it's totally cultural, and I think I uh, totally agree with what uh, George said before. Um, this is uh, uh, stereotypes, and it is that um, normally higher education is very, uh, in some uh, faculties, very genderized. For example, in the faculty of education, where I work, um, you might have a lesson with 40 students, and you might have 35 women and five boys. So education in this case, in primary education, in my opinion, is very genderized. But I have my own experience in higher education uh, teaching to engineers, and I had uh, uh, situations where uh, what I was seeing was all the way around. So I had 45, 50 students, and I only have two women uh, studying, I don't know, uh, industrial engineering or whatever. And, and I agree that we need to change this. Uh, but I actually, I think, I think that the change should be coming from bottom to top. Uh, so this is something that it should start in schools, uh, actually in primary education. Uh, so we should break with these roles and linking males to technology yes. and females to uh, caregiving or education. That is actually, unfortunately, something that is happening right now. I mean, one of the, we are doing things around this. One of the things we're thinking is that a lot of people don't really know what is done in jobs and don't really explore the options. And so I've been working with George on uh, developing uh, AI powered chatbot, which uh, people can use themselves in their own time just to explore different jobs. And we got some quite promising returns from it so far. So, I mean, I think that's one of the things, the careers of voice in most of our countries is very poor, or not so much is poor, it's very limited because careers of voice get very little time to spend with young people. And I think we can use technology helpfully and to support that. Should we move on to the next questions here? Yes. Uh, So, I, I will start on this. Uh, I mean, it, it's rather interesting, isn't it, that, it, it, that uh, with Greta Thunberg uh, and the whole movement against climate change comes from students, uh, but not from within the education 
system itself uh, and probably of all the crises which uh, is threatening people at the moment uh, the climate crisis is the biggest one so I'm sort of um, wondering first of all of course we've saved a lot of um, we, we, we've saved a lot of carbon Ooh, we're holding this meeting online and I'm wondering if, if the education conference circuit should ever go back to normal or to the old normal but what could we should we be doing within education around this crisis I don't know anyone else on the panel has got some ideas on this I think Graham, we, we we need to keep we, we cannot move everything online we need to keep the social aspect of that. And, uh, we need to, to find the right balance between uh, doing things online and uh, between uh, doing things face-to-face uh, -face, uh, in terms of conferences. But I think uh, education now has to play a significant role on fighting uh, climate crisis, especially the technology technology enhanced education and you know we can use uh, open educational resources related to that we can find uh, plenty of materials online in order to uh, to teach about uh, the, the climate crisis you know there are two things here one is to fight the climate crisis, climate crisis by changing our the way that we are doing things but also it's very important at the same time to teach about that and uh, you know, there are excellent tools and simulations and uh, this kind of stuff, I mean digital tools, to, to motivate people to, around uh, the, the problem of the, of the climate uh, crisis. I think um, all those online meetings are very um, comfortable because I can stay in my seat at home, very nice. <laughs> Um, I don't even have to dress myself uh, completely if I don't want to, but we, we miss the social contacts, the chit chats, the social network, and that's also a very human thing, I believe, and I miss that very, very uh, much, and, and I'm not the only one. Yeah, yeah. typically, uh, sorry, 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 yeah, go on. Um, yeah, I mean, I think education needs to both look at itself in terms of um, things like energy use and becoming carbon neutral and actually asking some of those difficult questions about its own practices, so whether that's its uh, computer use or electricity use or uh, travel to and from work. Um, so it needs to look at that internally. Um, I also think it needs to be led by student initiative, um, as we've seen um, with Greta Thunberg. Um, the younger generation are very aware of the issue and they have ideas and we have to listen to those ideas that they have. Um, in a sense, we've had 50 years of, of not sorting the issue uh, and I think we have to acknowledge that we have failed in, in some of those aspects. Um, I, I came across um, so Ian Woolley uh, made some comments, the, the way that he was tackling um, the greening of education was, was asking questions. So what are things made of? Uh, where did it come from? Why uh, does it look like that? Can I take it apart? Can I fix it? Can I reuse it? So it's, um, we're very quick to adopt new technologies and bring in new technology and new bits of equipment into the classroom, but maybe we need to stop and, and think, okay, what's the lifespan of this computer or this headset? Um, where does it go when I finished it with it? Can it be reused or recycled? And, and we need to start asking those, those difficult questions. <laughs> Yeah, very interesting comment, uh, David, because uh, Graham and me, we are working in a, in a project called CQ, and it uh, comes from Circular Economy for Youth. And, uh, for example, uh, 
considering what we have discussed before. An idea would be to, to upcycle uh, equipment that businesses don't uh, use anymore in order to provide them to, 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 to lower income uh, students, in order to have kind of technology and access all of those uh, uh, things. So there are ideas maybe, and uh, we need to, to exploit more those ideas, and uh, uh, we need initiatives, not us as uh, individuals, but to, 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 to present those ideas to governments, local, regional, European level, in order to, to provide those kind of solutions. The, the other thing I, I would say as, as a teacher is uh, teach outdoors. Um, there's, there's no better way of making students think about their environment than when they're in it. Um, it's very different when you're sitting in a classroom. If you take just one or two lessons outdoors and, and reconnect with nature and with the environment, that can go a long way to stimulating questions. And of course, uh, Pontodesky, um, the organisation in South Wales, which um, I'm part of, um, we're doing a whole load of initiatives in Pontypridd, which is a very small Welsh mining town, well, ex-mining town, with about 40,000 population, but uh, a whole number of initiatives through the CU project and other things, including, which I love, gorilla planting of gardening, basically gorilla gardening, that people are going out at night and planting things when they're not supposed to be planting things. But also, I mean, just on, on that repair issue, I, I noticed it popped up in my calendar that there's, um, I think, um, week on Saturday, there's the repair workshop. And there's loads of initiatives which kids are getting into uh, around this stuff. And I, I think really, uh, I tend to agree with David, that what we need to be doing is empowering young people and supporting young people. But of course, that doesn't stop the big oil industries, etc. Through continuing to churn out pollution, so I mean, yep, support the kids and work with them. Next questions, George. Oh dear. Someone else could start on this one. Yeah, I, I can start. It's a, it's a subject that uh, is a. Uh, uh, more and more coming in our in our days about uh, ethics, trust, and technology. We know that uh, there is uh, this big discussion about uh, uh, the personal data, but also when uh, we are going to to, to, to education. Uh, for example, we are looking at uh, new software developments around uh, automation in education, and. Uh, it's a, it's a very big discussion. I was reading an article uh, last week about uh, this uh, AI-powered assessment tools for uh, for uh, for uh, higher education, and uh, they, in the states, in the United States, they ended up that uh, they cannot trust it. They were biased because of uh, ineff uh, ineff insufficient uh, data. So yes, this is this is a, a, a very very Big deal. Also, the, the, the other questions, the other uh, questions we raised here about the open source software education or open educational resources. What do you think about that? Martina, you got anything on this one? No. Well, I'll say something, yeah. I'm never short of something to say. Um, I think the last question in this group is probably the biggest one. And I don't think we can have a deregulation of software industry as we've got it now. And certainly educational technology. One of the biggest dangers is more and more um, educational technology is coming in and increasingly leading to a privatization of education. Uh, but besides that, there's all manner of issues with some of these technologies. Um, the the online proctoring technologies, which completely discriminate against young people. Uh, I've got a nephew who is quite severely disabled in a wheelchair, um, who's intellectually very capable. 
but it's a massive problem for him uh, doing assessments because they want to use video-based proctoring uh, and they're saying that his movements, because he has trouble controlling his arms, his movements obviously make him look as if he's eating. And I mean, this stuff just going on with no thought about it and no control over it. So, uh, I mean, I think we very urgently need to regulate it. I noticed that the European Union, which has just put out the European Commission, has just put out a major report into the future of artificial intelligence and they've divided uh, it into three regulatory areas of, of software which is no danger at all, software you've got to keep an eye on and software which is high risk, three risk levels and education is within the high risk area. Uh, so say because qualifications um, and training and especially qualifications are so important to people and the dangers of bias in those systems is, is very great and that bias could have a major effect on people. So a big issue, big issue. I'll, I'll yes. give another example. Ah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go. Oh, I, I was I'd agree with that and having sort of spent a little while over the, the lockdown exploring virtual reality technologies uh, for, for use in a, a library context and, and meetings and also for, for training. Um, one of the, the sort of big question marks was over what happens to the data. Um, got um, location data, biometric data, uh, room views that the, the headsets use, um, their um, the data includes things like your movements um, and voice recognition, that sort of thing. Now they're moving into hand tracking and eye tracking. And that that's brilliant from a technology point of view, a technology user's point of view. Where does that data go? Is it anonymized? Who has oversight? Um, so they, potentially you're learning a lot about people, which is, is no bad thing, but as long as you can ensure the safety of the user. Um, so especially where you're talking about using these technologies in a school setting. So you'd be using it with minors, with people who uh, can't necessarily make those informed decisions about what happens to their data and we as educators have a role to be responsible with that data and ask questions about where's it going who's using it what's it being used for and, and don't you that, think uh, this sorry i think that probably needs to go up to a, a sort of a ministerial governmental level uh, because often these are, are big corporations that are, are bigger than than individual educational establishments or, or countries even in some cases. And don't you think this can be a problem <clears throat> uh, because it's reaching uh, a nation, they have their own laws and sometimes we are working with international, transnational projects, European projects and we're working with different uh, codes of laws uh, because as you said uh, you have the personal data working there, you have uh, education is a very, very uh, important issue. So uh, don't you think this can be also a problem for inter international research and working together for these uh, different perspectives you can have on the same topic? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm sure there'll be sort of a cultural variation, uh, both in, in the views of uh, the potential benefits and the risks from both the students and the, the educators, um, very much based geographically. And something something else, for example, all of us, we know that when we are visiting the website, there is this uh, pop-up window saying about cookies, etc. How many people, of how many of the visitors of any website understand what are the cookies and what they are doing? Of, at the same time, we are using all of us, we are using smartphones that are generating vast amount of data. 
So somehow we need regulations. And if you ask me for should be done in the international level, like European level or United Nations level or UNESCO level, have those uh, regulations about uh, how these data will be used uh, in educational uh, settings. Uh, we are uh, thinking more with Graham about uh, a project related to how we can use uh, big data to, to improve uh, that curriculum. But, you know, the biggest worry is not the technology, the, 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 the AI algorithms to do that. It has to do with data. Are those data representative enough or the system will generate something that is biased? And how we get those data and how we use those data? Those are questions are coming more and more often in front of us. And, uh, you know, and the problem for me is that it's coming very, very fast, very quick. Systems, uh, AI systems are, are going to be dominating uh, the education in the following years. So we need to, to, to be ready to deal with those uh, questions and those issues. And just to show you how fast it's happening, uh, I don't know if anyone saw the press reports or media reports on it, but uh, the English government uh, wishes to sell or to put up for auction the health data for 54 million people. In fact, they were planning to do it this week, but they were blocked by a high court who, who said this has to be reviewed and they're not convinced it's legal. So the government's view is, great, this data is really useful. Now they're not saying we want to use your data for the greatest benefit to people. They're trying to sell the data to make a lot of money out of it. The uh, medical data? Medical data. Anonymized what? medical data of 54 million people. Semi-anonymized. <laughs> Semi-anonymized. <laughs> kind yes, of. Yes. Kind of. <laughs> so so it, it, this, this problem of data and who owns data isn't a problem for the future. It's an issue now. And I would almost call it a crisis in itself now. Uh, I mean, the, the whole issue of the data. And sadly, uh, I don't think enough people uh, are aware of what's happening. So, I mean, artificial intelligence can have many benefits, but there are many issues with this sort of I think this is happening in the States, actually. Uh, what Graham, what you said, I think is happening in some parts of the United States right now. Yes, uh, that they can yes, yes. have access to your health data. And actually, the problem is not the government takes that information, is the problem is when they sell that information to private companies so they can decide to hire you or not to hire you, depending on this. And this is um, something that um, uh, have Rosen aware as well in Europe uh, about the vaccination process. Because uh, you know, some governments weren't thinking of, uh, you know, giving now the vaccination passport, for instance, and if that information should should be available for companies, uh, because companies might decide if they want to hire you or not, either if you have uh, if you have taken the vaccination or not. So uh, that is something that has to do with your free will as well, no? So. Hmm. This is this is happening now, Gorka. And there is in Greece yesterday. The government announced that, for example, one of the benefit, uh, some companies they have the right not to hire someone uh, because he's not vaccinated. And uh, you know, I, I can understand what is happening with the pandemic. But and if we if we look more general, you know, the uh, those data can be used with anything. And if we go to the to the set, to the sector of education. Those data can define educational system and uh, make decisions that uh, uh, maybe it's not it's not correct. It's, this is the, the problem. I didn't know that was happening in Greece. Actually, I know that they tried to do in some countries in Europe, but actually the they decided that uh, that was a big problem. But I, I wasn't informed that uh, this was happening in Greece, and I think that is very very dangerous. Because the vaccination can be just the first excuse for further actions in the future with other things. 
maybe you have diabetes, maybe you want to get yeah. pregnant, stuff like that. So they, they might decide not to hire you. Yes, and how many employers are Googling their um, solicitors, uh, solic uh, the, the, guy, the people who are asking for a job? Well, you Google them. I'll, I'll give you another very strange example. You know, when you are searching Google, now the biggest owners for, of, of data, of personal data in the world are Google, uh, uh, Amazon, and uh, Facebook. Yeah, all of those social network platforms. If you search, for example, how to repair your car, maybe those data can be combined with other data, and then when you go to, to get the, to renew the insurance of your car, the AI algorithm will say, okay, last year you did five repairs in your car, and most probably you are driving dangerously, you are not taking care of your car pretty much, so your insurance uh, price has to be increased. And this is not directly generated by your personal data, but your searches and your total behavior online. And the problem is that we generate so much data every single day. You know, if we go, if we get the other example, what China did and other countries with, uh, with these applications you have to install with, uh, during the current time, where you, you, you have to open it all the time and see with which person you, you've been in touch or you, you've been close because tracking your location. This is crazy. It's a little game I have with the companies. It's, I'm always very happy if I get an advert which has absolutely no relevance to me whatsoever or to the place I'm in. But it's hard work to stop them tracking you, you know? Yeah. It's worth trying. It, 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 if you want to see what's going on, you can try this yourself. Try to stop them tracking you and see what happens to your adverts and see if the adverts have any sense to you at all. I like it like when they're in the wrong language in the wrong country, but it's very hard to do. I you know, often spend a day with my students and we do a social media search of themselves um, from an employer's perspective. You know, sort of what can you find out about yourself on Facebook or on Twitter or on Google? Um, and that often opens people's eyes to the sort of things they've published and um, you know, how it looks when you're going for a job interview and, and this is the first thing I see about you. Um, and, and teaching students to recognise the importance of it and how to turn it around and use it in a positive way, as well as being very conscious about what you're sharing with whom and, and how. Mm after makes for lively discussions. So let's move to the next topic. That one. Grab, do you mind to... to well, that was my question, wasn't it? Well, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think this is going on. Uh, I mean, is university, is public education happening? You've got Google now, so we're running the Google Academy, or Microsoft running the Microsoft Academy. Microsoft is running online courses and certifying them with a Microsoft certified whatever it is. Uh, and of course, for jobs, people are probably far more impressed with, um, with a Microsoft certificate than uh, one from Pontypridd College. Uh, further education college in, in, in Pontypri. So I think there is a challenge to universities and I think universities have got to rethink themselves. Uh, I mean to some extent I think the universities have got into this trap themselves but in many countries buying in to an employability agenda of saying the most important thing is you get jobs by having a degree, but then you've got 55% of the UK population of young people participating, getting a degree, so they're all fighting each other, and they're not really thinking about what's the real value of a university education. So I, I think there are, are problems there. Yes, I, I, 
I would agree that in unfortunately in the UK certainly uh, the degree system has been monetized um, student loans are underwritten by the government um, I, I don't think universities are going to disappear I don't think you should uh, but I do think they need to adapt and change uh, and change quite dramatically um, uh, I mean I, I love recent studies at universities um, I do as well as IT part of my or when I'm not in front of a computer I'm, I'm teaching botany uh, and so that's in the field and that's fantastic because it's it's again engaging with students in a completely different way but then looking at how you can use technology in that context uh, or vice versa um, so I think universities do have to adapt uh, and those that don't adapt will die out um, I think there will be a, a, a rationalization of universities shall we say it is dangerous, though, um, changing the structure of the whole university. I mean, we're, we're seeing here that more and more open universities, online universities are growing all over the place. They're becoming businesses, actually, ways of making money. And actually, we're losing the essence of the university, which is the face-to-face -face teaching, for instance. I mean, I, I cannot imagine a doctor uh, learning how to be a doctor online. I mean, uh, so yes, I totally agree with you that we need to rethink the universities, but in such a way that uh, the whole uh, sense, the whole structure doesn't change that dramatically, as I think uh, these new universities are, you know, these Microsoft or Google universities and so on. Um, when I studied anthropology so many years ago, uh, I, I, I remember that uh, we were always told that uh, nations and traditional structures were disappearing or changing. So states, nations, classic universities, uh, you know, educational structures will, will, will disappear and uh, the companies will gain power. And we thought that it was crazy. That was a very dystopic idea, yeah? But at the end of the day, uh, as you guys say, this is happening. So I think we have to be very careful um, on how to uh, think of a future university and, and how Cal how could this bring to our lives, you know? So I think we shouldn't lose this uh, uh, contact with students in a classic way. Yes, that's very valuable. But I think, I think universities should become more, more flexible. Uh, and uh, technology has a role, to play, a role to play there, to be the curriculum needs to be more flexible in order to, 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 to include more uh, different uh, topics into more different areas. And of course, there are some uh, some uh, university degrees like medicine. You mentioned, uh, Korka, that at the say uh, at the moment it's not possible to be taught online. But in a, in a, in, a, in some uh, years with uh, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, most probably uh, could be could be doable. We don't know, but. At the same time, we, you have all of these uh, technology-related jobs, especially programming and uh, developing and uh, software engineering that uh, goes... Uh, most of the people, they don't care to, to, to fix the university. They are doing those uh, very, very quick courses and they find well-paid jobs uh, based on those uh, skills. But we know that uh, things are changing and are changing pretty fast. And the problem is that universities are not changing the same way. Are very, very, you know, uh, uh, paleolithic uh, organizations that doing things slowly. And uh, we need to find the right way to follow the to follow the progress. But George, the thing is, who is who is promoting that change? And that's what worries me. I mean, is the companies, is the companies themselves that want to change the whole system? I mean, yeah, it is true, and you are right. I mean, doctors can learn how to operate, how to make a surgery using virtual reality plus artificial intelligence. But where is the contact with the patient? You know, we are losing some stuff that, you know, these um, professionals should, should have. So what it worries me is who is implementing the change. Universities should adapt, should be something modern, but um, we have to be aware uh, about who is implementing and who is pushing the changes, I think, yeah.
So I, I think you also need to, to flip it round the other way. And 13 and 14 year olds at the moment will, they, they grow up with virtual reality. You know, they'll spend all weekend with a VR headset on. When they get to college or when they get to university, they expect it. it it's part of their day-to-day -day life in the same way as a mobile phone is now uh, that wasn't to you know, a non-digital native. So I think the next generate or the generation that is coming through will have an expectation that these technologies are embedded or are available if they want to use them. Exactly. And also we don't know what are the jobs uh, for the next generation. As I told you before, my daughter is 11 years old and I don't know. If you ask me what job uh, your daughter will do in the future, maybe it's not invented yet. It's not here yet. So we need. Yes, yeah, come, please. Well, I think we've got to be a bit careful here because we're sitting here politely saying, oh no, something like medical, no, no, we can't do online learning. But I've done a bit of work with an organization called AMI, which I can't remember what it stands for, but it's the Association of Medical Educators uh, for the world or for Europe or anyway. And they have huge conferences of about two, uh, medical educators of about 2,000, 2,500 every year. And they are leading in many ways in the use of technology for learning. So we have to be a bit careful that we don't start dividing things up and saying, no, wouldn't work there, wouldn't work there, will work there, won't work there. Uh, there's a lot of innovation going on in medical education. Uh, through the use of technology at the moment. And I have to say, a lot more appreciation of ethics within that community than probably other ones, as, than uh, many other communities. We have more, nine minutes more, so uh, I recommend to go to the next uh, slide. I think we have how many? Uh, we have some, okay. Let's go just uh, quickly to. Sorry, George, for interrupting. I think we should leave at least a couple of minutes for possible questions. So maybe someone wants to ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, for, sure, for, just, sure, for sure, Yes, I, I go. We, we covered the, this digital skills uh, thing has been covered uh, previously. And uh, AI, of course, uh, we, we talked a lot about AI. Uh, yeah, and this is the topic we have uh, already discussed right uh, right now. It's about uh, uh, higher education uh, and uh, what is the role of higher education. And uh, this one one thing to mention here is the, because this uh, the last point is mine. Is, you know, we we know from from uh, different studies that uh, automation you, because of automation a lot of jobs will be lost. And we know that for sure, and it's coming, and it's coming pretty quick. The following 10 years, uh, a lot of jobs will be lost. I'll give you an example. The biggest, uh, the, the sector with the more employers in the States and most probably in other countries is the truck drivers. Ten, in 10 years from now, most probably all the, truck, all the trucks will be self-driving. What we are doing with those people? What is our role? What is What we have to do? We cannot uh, throw them out from the system. So what, how, how to, how to upskill or reskill or what we are doing all of those people? Because we know that automation generates uh, jobs, but those jobs are for high or mid-skilled uh, data, data workers. But uh, what's happening with the rest? That's a, 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 a point that was to, to, to be discussed. I think a new crisis will be created then. No, but I guess that in every industrial revolution, this same problem happened. Yeah. Uh, when Ford designed the same production with cars, or when here in the Basque Country or England, the industrial revolution happened, uh, you know, millions of jobs were lost. So, um, yeah, I, I think that what we should do is thinking of uh, innovation, and adapting uh, the innovation, educational innovation, to to discover new jobs, uh, so these people can be, you know, resettled in some other uh, places. But 
yeah, I mean, uh, how can, how are you gonna re-educate to say it in a way, uh, attract driver? I mean, that is gonna be very difficult, yeah. So actually I think governments and professionals will need to find solutions before the problem happens because that is gonna be a crisis, a real crisis too. Yeah. I think now is the right time to ask all those people who participate to that and just listen to us to, <laughs> to, to describe it. If they have any questions, to, I will be very happy to, to try to answer those. Okay, let, let me ask. Um, so, um, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta eh, en inglés o en castellano, la podemos traducir. Bueno, entiendo que se ha visto en la conferencia, habréis entendido todo. But if you have any questions, si queréis hacer alguna pregunta, uh, tenemos uh, cinco minutos antes de que termine la sesión. Entonces, eh, 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 los ponentes están más que encantados de, de que les preguntéis. I think you you said at the beginning that people are shy sometimes when asking about these kind of things, isn't it? Sorry, can you say it again? No, 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 that, no, no, that sometimes people are shy of asking things. So, ah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> they, they can use the chat. They can use the chat to write it. If they don't like to, 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 to talk, let just go to the chat uh, facility and... Uh, Ask your question que, there. que podéis utilizar el chat si, si preferís no hablar o queréis hacerla por escrito, les podéis escribir en el chat también. I have uh, maybe a, a question for the pat for for those watching, as, as I'm assuming most of them are educators or in an educational context, mm -hmm. um, which is was one that popped up earlier on one of the slides and we sort of jumped over, but what do people think will be the the next change in the classroom um, that they will have to, to cope with as educators or as teachers? Do you want me to translate that just in case? Okay, if, if you don't mind. Bueno, tenéis una, una pregunta del, de los ponentes a, al público y es eh, sobre los temas que hemos estado viendo en esta, en esta mesa. A ver, ¿cuál es la impresión que tenéis vosotros y vosotras en torno a qué cambios pueden suceder próximamente en las aulas, teniendo en cuenta uh, la tecnología? ¿Qué creéis que, que va a cambiar en vuestras vidas o, o dentro de, de las aulas? Or someone someone wrote something on the on the chat so it says I think that all of you are impressed with the amount of interest in ideas you have served. I would like to say thank you all and say that we have to keep working on how to manage with technology and education. Yeah, thanks, Christina. Yeah, so that's right. Mm -hmm. No, it is so overwhelming having so much information. Um, for instance, now we are working on different projects related with uh, artificial intelligence. And every time I think of it, uh, I actually is a bit scary is that are we going to have teachers in 20 years inside the classrooms? Is it going to be a virtual teacher on our on our screens? You know, so as you guys say before, I mean, this is changing so fast that is that is so scary. You know, I, I tell you something, uh, something like 20 years ago, uh, with Graham, we, we, we found something called Horizon Report. And uh, it was a report trying to predict the future for uh, uh, what will be happening in the next uh, uh, five years, three years, or next decade. I'm thinking and I'm trying to, to read against the reports uh, from the previous decade. You know, and in some, some, some uh, areas, we, it was correct. But in the, in the area of artificial intelligence and what is happening with that, they, they, they couldn't even imagine how fast it goes. But it's also a lot of their predictions were wrong. And one of the problems is education, it, it, and technology in education is very, uh, very um, vulnerable to hype. 
uh, something becomes the new big thing and everyone's talking about it. Uh, I mean, I work as a reviewer for uh, UFI in the UK, which is one of the biggest funding of, of projects in technology and vocational education. And every year there's a different thing. So this year I'd say that 35% of the bids, we had about, four, about 300 bids. And I'd say 150 of them were about virtual and, and augmented reality. Next year, it will be something else. Uh, and that's how it goes. So predicting the future is very hard. I do think, mind, it's, it's, it's worth thinking about the fact, uh, from what Gorka said, that the largest language learning provider in the world, right? The language is every country, a lot of people learn languages, a lot of demand for language courses. The largest provider of learning courses in the world is Duolingo, Duolingo, which is an artificial intelligence program with no face-to-face -face or physical teachers. Mm -hmm. So, Graham, you have you have to, to close this uh, this panel in Spanish to prove that uh, Duolingo it works. <laughs> it's not that good. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think it's uh, it's half past four. I think we're yeah. getting towards. The end what do you think, Gorka? Okay. Yeah, I, I was I was checking just checking the you know I'm I'm in with anything you you say I'm uh, I always agree I I have nothing else to say so what can I say about this topic if you are the European experts so. <laughs> Well, um, I think. All right, sorry about that, Graham. You want to say something? No, no, I think okay. I'm talking. Okay, sorry. I think. Okay, yeah, you know, you know, um, um, we were talking about before the 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 gaps, uh, with the. Uh, uh, when you live in a rural area, so I'm I'm sharing my internet with my mobile phone, so sometimes I'm losing my connection. Nonetheless. It is um, half past four, so we we are gonna move on to. I think we have not a break, and then we have uh, other presentations and so on. So what I like to do is thank you, uh, uh, David, George, Graham, and Martin, for this very interesting uh, discussion on um, uh, the use of new technologies in crisis uh, times. So. Um, I hope everyone, uh, you know, enjoyed. I did actually. So, thank you one more time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. And and you guys, yeah. If you wanna just join the rest of the people, we have now like a fever break. Uh, so you can just join there. Or otherwise, you I'll see you soon. <laughs> I just want to thank say you very much once again. I just want to say one more thing, uh, Gorka, if it's okay. Yeah. That we have right. to be um, very aware of the fact that um, there are not that um, that strong um, uh, cognitive. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> In, um, um, they oh, your sound has gone, Martin. M Martin, yeah, I can hear you, Martin. Your 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 son is not working. Oh, okay. Now it, now it is. Okay. Now it's not. Okay. I'm <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <laughs> this is the gap. This is what we were talking about. Yes. <laughs> Technology gap. <laughs> you feel like one on one, face to face talking, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I um, I was uh, saying that we have to be careful with the students that are not that um, high educated because we have to warn them about all those dangers. Eh? All those vocational students, they don't understand all the dangers. Eh? It's very important we, we uh, tell them about that because they don't know the dangers they don't think about dangers like we do that was uh, what i would say. no totally i agree now we are working uh, with a project with this called cyber mediators um, and it's just 
trying that the students help other students not to make those mistakes. I don't know how to call it because information, uh, your own information is very, very sensitive. And, and you know, I uh, think was uh, George talking about, or Graham, I don't remember, about the cookies and all these things. We are sharing our lives, our information, and we are not taking care of that. So we need to teach our students to take care about that and, and to be very, very careful because, because this is a jungle. This is, uh, the internet is a jungle. So we need to be very careful with with ourselves, but mainly with, um, with uh, our students. So yeah, totally agree with you. So well, so thank you very much once again uh, uh, to all the speakers, David, George, Graham, Martin. So uh, thank you and, and and see you soon. See you. Bye. 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 Adios. 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 This is my, my <laughs> Bye. If I saw.